welcome Professor, National University of Singapore, and Principal Investigator, Center for Quantum Technologies, Alexander Ling. Okay, um, thank you everyone uh, for coming today to listen to my talk. Um, I represent the local quantum community and quantum technology is one of these frontier technologies that Singapore has been investing in very heavily. At the center, which is based at the National University of Singapore, or NUS, we have about 20 odd research groups and in addition to that, around the island, we have a consortium called Quantum SG, where there's about 40 different research groups spread across all the universities and research centers. What I want to talk about today is to share a little bit about the opportunities that quantum computing or quantum information technology can bring to society, but also to share a little bit about the risks uh, that quantum computing uh, actually represents. So the topic of my talk is, as you can see, keeping secrets in the quantum era. Now, we are on the verge of a very exciting time because you know, every time we discover new physics, we believe that sometimes we can lead to new technologies. Like in the past, you know, we have steam engines, radios, semiconductor physics. Over the past decades, we have actually achieved very good control over individual quantum systems. For example, uh, you know, we know how to control individual atoms or ions, so we can uh, indiv control individual particles of light. So with all this quantum physics that is at our control nowadays, we feel that we're on the verge of a possible new industrial revolution powered by quantum information. Now, all of this quantum technology that we are talking about, that you hear about in the press, all of it is built on the concept of combining information science with quantum physics. All the information processing that we have today uh, is based on the conventional bit of information where you have a, a piece of device that can store a state of information as a zero or a one. When you talk about quantum information, we need to change our concepts a little bit and we should talk about the quantum bit or the qubit. Now a qubit is a device which can store uh, zero and one at the same time, and so also not just of equal probability, but you can also tune the probability that this device is a zero or a one. It is a continuous state uh, of information. The simultaneous existence of the zero and one makes it actually quite powerful. Now, when we talk about qubits or quantum information systems, often people get a bit confused. They said, isn't uh, quantum about uh, subatomic particles? Well, yes, that's where it first started. That's where the uh, principles and the first effects of quantum physics were observed uh, in subatomic particles. But nowadays, you know, quantum systems can be actually quite large. You can observe quantum physics, quantum phenomena in molecules that is made out of a very large number of uh, atoms. Um, they can be particles of light that we call photons, and the photons can actually be quite uh, large objects. And at the same time, you can actually observe them in electrical circuits. For example, IBM has been working on quantum computing circuits that are based on superconductor chips. And these superconductor chips are actually devices that you can hold in your hand. But by carefully controlling this electrical circuit, you can make it exhibit quantum phenomena. So quantum information technology has really moved out of the realm of you know, subatomic physics into things that, in devices that we can actually uh, manufacture with very high quality. All of this quantum information technology that we talk about are roughly divided into three domains. Uh, you can think of it as being useful for communications, uh, for computing, uh, and also for metrology, which is the science of very careful measurements or sensors, as you say. Um, all of them are actually really exciting. Like, um, you no, know, just a couple of uh, days ago, uh, Google actually announced that, according to their definition, they have a, built a quantum computer that has achieved quantum supremacy. It means that they have a device that can actually achieve computational uh, tasks that would take a supercomputer, you know, exponentially much longer time. Um, whether it's days or years, it's up to debate. But the fact that we believe that we are now in the era where a quantum computer has uh, supremacy over conventional devices. 
Now, in terms of quantum supremacy, um, computing is definitely very exciting, but quantum supremacy for communications and for sensing has been around for quite a while. For example, you think about the atomic clock. That's a kind of quantum technology that's a quantum supremacy for decades. So we believe that as more and more of this advances uh, approach becomes very exciting because we can think of how to deploy them outside the laboratory and actually use them for uh, very interesting tasks. Now, with this kind of acknowledgement about the process that we've been, uh, progress that we've been making, there's growing global investment in, in quantum science and technology. Uh, you know, the Chinese, uh, the Europeans, and the US have uh, national flagship programs, okay? And at the same time, we're not just seeing government funding for universities and research institutes, we're also seeing a growing quantum ecosystem, or as some of my colleagues at SG Innovate like to talk about, they talk about a growing quantum economy. Uh, here's just a very short list that I, we put together about all the companies that have made announcements about their investments in quantum science and technology. Uh, this is sort of outdated by now, because every week you hear of a new company putting up uh, their involvement in the field. Singapore is not alone in trying to explore uh, the advantages of, of quantum systems for you know, industry and society. Uh, for example, Singtel is listed up here. Uh, the National University of Singapore and Singtel have a small project in the uh, cybersecurity lab where we try to explore how you know, quantum communications uh, can be carried out over the very rich fiber network that we have in Singapore. And on the um, right-hand side of your slides, you see a list of, of spin-off companies uh, from the Center for Quantum Technologies as well. So worldwide, uh, including here in Singapore, we have companies that are actually exploring uh, the possibilities and the market value of quantum technologies. Now, let's just go a little bit back and talk about why do people want to build a quantum computer? Now, we have to realize that a quantum computer is not a general CPU that you are actually going to uh, find your conventional computers. A quantum computer is more like a hardware accelerator that can solve very specific problems very quickly. The main reason why we want a quantum computer is like what Richard Feynman pointed out. You know, if you want a, a computer that can actually predict how our you know, universe works, how different aspects uh, of, say, chemistry works, you need to make that computer a quantum computer because chemistry essentially is a quantum process. And this idea can actually be extended to quite a, a large number of fields as well. So, as I have stated, we believe that we are now in a very exciting era of quantum supremacy, but that's not enough. We want to move on towards quantum advantage. Quantum advantage means that finding practical problems you know, resolving industry pain points using quantum computers and quantum technology in general. Now, we think about quantum computers, what are they good for? They are good for simulation, as Richard Feynman was thinking about. They're also very good for optimization. For example, uh, Lockheed Martin has been using quantum computers to try and optimize the uh, avionics software that they have been building. And other companies are talking about using it for uh, logistics uh, and other things like that. Um, at the same time, a quantum computer is also very good for you know, doing unstructured search. You have some kind of database that you need to search through, a quantum computer will actually give you an advantage. And finally, there's actually a very interesting uh, point, is that the quantum computer can also do something called very fast factorization. As, uh, and this problem is where the quantum computer actually represents a kind of risk. Now, what am I talking about when I discuss factorization? Well, I'm talking about the fact that most of our encryption that we use for privacy in communication today is based on a mathematical process where you take two very large prime numbers and you multiply them, and it's actually very difficult to factorize the output. You can get the output, but you don't actually know how to find the uh, two factors of the output very easily. Now, this problem, <laughs> as far as I can tell, actually has absolutely no application anywhere else uh, in society except for encryption. Now, it turns out that, unfortunately, the quantum computer is also very good at cracking this problem. Yeah, it gives you an exponential uh, advantage. So there's certain implications for communication security. 
For example, we take the RSA protocol. Uh, we believe that a uh, universal fault-tolerant quantum computer can actually crack uh, you know, secure communications today, and that actually puts our privacy at risk. Now, we don't have a quantum computer like that yet today, but progress in the field is actually going very quickly. And one of the things that we have to think about is long-term communication security as well. For example, if we have data that we need to store for 80 years, 90 years, or even longer than that, then one needs to think about how we begin to implement quantum-safe methods for our communication. Um, it is probably a well-known fact that uh, sensitive information is being recorded and being worked on uh, to be cracked open uh, some decades in the future. One of the you know, things that in the past people used to say that the quantum computer is probably like a 50-year problem, and as we heard earlier, uh, you know, I mean, academics say that it's a 50-year problem, we don't know when it's going to come. But um, the timelines seem to be shortening very rapidly. For example, uh, this year, there was a, a very nice theory paper that came out that pointed out that, you know, to break RSA, with, which is 2,048 bits long, you need only about 20 uh, million qu qubits in eight hours. This is dramatically much smaller than previous estimates. And when I talk to my computer science colleagues about this paper, they tell me that this is probably some kind of upper bound, which can actually be brought down even further with more research in the future. So this is something that we have to think about. Now, what kind of methods can we use to ensure that our communications are quantum safe? For example, you're thinking in terms of uh, you know, software communications. Uh, NIST has actually a very nice table that they published. And they show that you know, if you're talking about the basic foundations of public key infrastructure, where you're doing asymmetric key distribution using RSA or elliptical curves, in the quantum era, you have no security. What's interesting, however, is that you will still get security in a symmetric key encryption system. This is because in a symmetric key encryption system, the entire process is built on the idea of shared security between the parties and no amount of computing power is going to help you uh, crack that. So this is very interesting. We have to find another way to distribute these secret keys so that our symmetric encryption engines can continue to work. At the moment, all the symmetric encryption engines are actually relying on um, RSA or ECC type devices. So it turns out that we are aware of the problems and we actually have some solutions, okay? One of the solutions actually come from quantum physics itself. It's this technology known as quantum key distribution, which I'll talk about uh, a little later on in my slides. But right now, I also want to point out that quantum key distribution by itself is an optical technology, so it's not going to be the solution for everything. It is the, we need to combine quantum key distribution also with mathematical processes to replace the existing PKI systems. And this is known as post-quantum cryptography. So NIST uh, is also working on these standards. Uh, what I hear is that some of these uh, standards are work is going forward, and hopefully it will be finalized sometime in the next couple of years, maybe 2021 or 2022. So in the future, we believe that for communications security, we're going to have a hybrid ecosystem combining both PQC and QKD. Now, in this hybrid ecosystem, what we're talking about is that you have, say, a symmetric engine that you want to use and you want to encrypt it, what you have to do is you must make sure that they share a QKD transceiver on the two sides. And now there are many ways to do quantum key distribution, and I'm just going to share with you one of the ways where we are working on it in, in Singapore, where we think it's actually quite secure. This uses the concept of uh, entanglement. Um, essentially what happens is that you can actually have this device that produces pairs of photons that actually uh, can be received by these parties uh, at the bottom over here. And this is actually a technology that we have been working on with Singtel uh, over the last couple of years. Now, just to move on, quantum key distribution networks are being built all around the world, okay? And China actually has the world's largest QKD network at the moment. It's a link that's about 2,000 kilometers long, linking Beijing and Shanghai. And they'll also started investing and demonstrating that quantum key distribution can work from satellites as well in order to build a global network. 
Now, other countries around the world that are working very hard on it is, for example, I can think of uh, South Korea's SK Telecom. Uh, in Europe, there are multiple plans going on. And in the US, there have been some research. Uh, in the commercial domain, there is actually a plan to build a QKD network between data centers in New Jersey uh, with the financial centers in New York. Um, quantum P distribution technology is actually quite robust. So this is an example of the system that we built uh, in Singapore you know, 16 years ago, actually. Um, what happens, what's happening over here is that you will actually have two parties with computers on two ends, and you actually have a quantum light source in the center. 16 years ago, the quantum light source was this big black box that you see in the center. But recently, what we have been doing is we've been shrinking that technology down to something that you can hold in the palm of your hand, which is that little aluminum box that's sitting right in front of the black box over there. And you can see that with research progress, we are able to shrink down also the quantum communication devices. Now, for quantum-based no, network monitoring, this is uh, another idea that we've had recently, is that these quantum particles that we're sending over the optical fibers in Singapore um, actually can also be used for sensing as well. Okay? Over here, what you're looking at is, for example, uh, the bits of information that we can actually retrieve from a, a live demonstration in Singapore. Uh, if you start out with 2,500 raw bits of detection events, where you're converting the detected photons into bits of zeros and ones, you can get this red line at the bottom, which is about six or 700 bits per second, which is more than enough to you know, rekey an AES engine that needs 256 bits. But moving forward, we, one of the things that we noticed in our work with Singtel and over the fiber networks is that you can also use this technology as a quantum sensor. And what you're looking at over here is we are looking at the drift of the optical fiber network that was provided to the university. It was a 10 kilometer uh, piece of fiber, and you could actually look at this fiber breathing during the day and night cycle. It gets longer, it gets shorter because you know, it gets hotter and it gets cooler. And you can actually get very high precision. And this precision is not limited by the range. In fact, the longer you, you send these quantum signals over the fiber, you get even better sensitivity over how the quantum signals change. So one of the things we're thinking about with this technology is how we can actually use the quantum signals, not only just for quantum key distribution, for security, but perhaps we could use it to monitor the fiber networks. At the same time, we could actually use it to you know, synchronize clocks. Right? And this is actually very important. It turns out that clock synchronization is very important for a lot of critical infrastructure. In any case, I'm at the end of my talk now. And I'd just like to summarize uh, with everyone that we should be aware, uh, as, a, as a tech developers, as people interested in technology, that quantum computing and quantum information technology is progressing very rapidly. Okay? It's very nice, it's very exciting. There's lots of problems that we can work on, but we should also be aware that there are certain threats to society. Communication security is going to be compromised. Public key crypto systems are under threat. It could take you know, uh, several years before the software systems are refreshed with the new standards. So we should begin to think now, actually, about how to move to a hybrid you know, quantum key distribution and software method and explore novel use cases. So this is uh, the parting message that I have. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>